Welcome back to the Petty Podcast. This is podcast number two. The title of this podcast is, What the Heck is an IH or an Industrial Hygienist? Well, an industrial hygienist is um, technically under the American Industrial Hygiene Association. It's a little bit of a long-winded uh, definition, but it's worth reading. An industrial hygienist is uh, someone who's involved in the science and art devoted to the anticipation, keyword, recognition, evaluation, and control of those environmental factors or stressors arising in or from the workplace, which may cause sickness, impaired health, and well-being, or significant discomfort among workers and among citizens in the community. Of course, really impaired health would be if it kills you. So we're interested in things that can make you uncomfortable all the way to things that can make you so sick that you may pass. So the field of industrial hygiene is obviously associated with exposure, personal protective equipment, and warnings. In other words, control of these hazards that you may encounter. The difficulty we face, particularly today in the COVID world, is that most of the people talking about exposure and control of exposure are medical doctors. And while they may be perfectly uh, very intelligent individuals, they really are not industrial hygienists, whose goal, again, is the control of exposures and determination of what PPE to wear and when. And as a consequence, we're getting a lot of misinformation from people, particularly physicians in the media, talking about industrial hygiene. Again, industrial hygienists are not, asso- as I say on the bottom, are not associated with dentistry. We're not industrial hygiene folks. We're industrial hygienists, and our goal primarily is the control, ultimately the recognition, evaluation, and control of things that can hurt you. Now, with respect to exposure, really you can be exposed one of four ways. You can either inhale it through, uh, breathing it in through your lungs. You can have it deposit on your skin. We call that dermal. You can ingest it by either drinking or eating it. Or, in a rare cases, like drug users, it can be injected intravenously. For COVID, the real pathway is inhalation of these four. Now, some truisms about exposure. First of all, and these are the common sense things I'd like to remind people of, even though it's, it's rooted in the field of industrial hygiene, these are common sense ideas. First of all, for exposure, the lower the concentration, the better. So we always want to minimize exp- uh, exposure with respect to concentration. And <clears throat> regardless of the concentration, the less time you spend in an area where there's a potential hazardous material, or biologic, the better. In general, you would think that being further away from the source would be better than not, but if you're in an indoor environment, and particularly with COVID, where the ventilation may not be so good and the particles are so small, as we'll talk about, that they stay suspended for hours to days, the distance is not nearly as important as the concepts of concentration lower is better and time less is better. I want to talk briefly about one of the core concepts of industrial hygiene, and that is this term called hierarchy of controls. And hierarchy of controls was developed by the National Safety Council in about 1950, although um, elements of it are recognized back into the 1920s. And what this shows is what an industrial hygienist, or what in general one who is trying to control a hazard should do from the most effective to the least effective. So the most effective items are towards the top, and the the least effective items are towards the bottom. Now, with respect to COVID, substitution and elimination, if if the COVID uh, virons are around, is is really not an option. Um, The next best thing we can do is what we call engineering controls, and that means we can either try to dilute through ventilation, destroy or contain the COVID 
uh, environs. Obviously, containment is probably not realistic, but certainly dilution and destruction are. And there are two areas um, that are not well recognized or heard of in the last year or so when we've had this COVID issue. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, which for inhalation means respirators, is the way that one protects someone um, generally in the short term. You don't want a long term, you don't want people in the long term in uh, respirators or PPE because they, it's well recognized for decades that uh, people don't wear PPE properly. It's important to recognize in this whole COVID issue that masks are not PPE and they're not respirators. And so they don't even fit within the hierarchy of controls. They're below the hierarchy of controls. So it's key to remember that the most effective thing would be engineering controls. The least effective thing would be personal protective equipment or respirators, and that masks are not respirators. Just to illustrate what respirators really are, on the left we have an N95, picture of an N95, and on the right we have a picture of a half-face respirator. Again, the, the N95 uh, respirators are technically respirators, but they're sort of the bottom of the barrel, um, the least effective respirator one can wear. Again, the point to be made is masks don't look like these things and are not respirators. And oftentimes you see people in the public domain, whether it be media, governmental officials, uh, they conflate masks with respirators. They are not the same. The main reason is you can seal the edges of a respirator. You cannot seal the edges of a mask. What does OSHA say about um, all of this? Well, while this slide is a little bit busy, um, they, they recommend you wear a mask, but then uh, on the first page of their guidance. But then if you read in a little deeper, which most people probably don't, they make the following statement. Surgical masks are not respirators and do not provide the same level of protection to workers as properly fitted respirators. Quote, unquote, cloth favoring, face coverings are not acceptable substitutes for respirators. This is consistent with what I've been saying. The reason that, that surgical masks and cloth face coverings are not acceptable for respirators is that they can't be properly fitted. They leak around the edges between the edge of the face covering and the face. Again, masks are not respirators. The terms are often conflated. And the reason that this is the case is because they really can't be fit tested. Um, there's only one standard out there under OSHA, and that's the Respiratory Protection Standard, otherwise known as 29 CFR 134. And masks cannot comply with that standard. So what you have is OSHA recommends a mask, but then if you read a little deeper in, you can see that they really take that back. CDC really says the same thing. They, they've been recommending people wear masks, but they actually produce this document, which compares the performance of masks with that of respirators. Note that under masks, it says, quote unquote, do not provide the wearer with a reliable level of protection from inhaling small, smaller airborne particles and is not considered respiratory protection. So it's not respiratory PPE and it will not protect you from aerosols or the little guys as I talk about. Whereas a respirator filters out at least 95% of the particles, including both the large and the small particles. The terms large and small I'll talk about in another podcast, but large is synonymous with droplets, the large or big guys, and the small particles are synonymous with resp uh, respirable particles or otherwise known as aerosols. And there's been large conflation about these two terms. The particles, the big particles are much less concerned than the little particles, as we'll talk about at length. And of course, the problem with masks, as I've said before, is that the leakage occurs around the edge of the mask, so you can't seal it, whereas respirators are designed, in fact, to be able to be sealed and tested to ensure that they seal. I thought it would be interesting for you all to look at and see um, more about this respiratory protection standard under OSHA. Again, it's 
under what we call 29 Code of Federal Regulations 1910.134, and it's the only respiratory protection standard that I'm aware of under OSHA, and it's been around for decades. And I thought, well, it'd be really interesting to compare a mask in terms of meeting the major provisions of the respiratory protection standard versus a respirator. And what you'll see as you go down these criteria is that the masks don't meet any of the key OSHA respiratory protection standard requirements. For example, um, you're not required if you wear a mask to have a medical clearance to make sure you don't have pre-existing conditions to wear that mask. Under a respira- uh, if you wear a respirator under the respiratory protection standard, you are. You're also not allowed to uh, wear facial hair because the facial hair breaks the seal. And how many people do you see walking around, particularly males, with facial hair and they're wearing a mask? Well, there's no seal. You also have to be fit tested to make sure that uh, a respirator seals. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to do its job. Well, there is no fit test requirement on a mask. And that fit test must be done annually under the respiratory protection standard. There's no annual requirement for a, um, a fit test for, on a mask. There's no criteria on how long you can use the mask or uh, when it should be replaced. For example, um, it's well recognized now that the masks are great zones for um, picking up uh, and becoming um, moist, and and they're great because of the temperature and the humidity levels. Uh, Great grounds for the growth of biologics, both bacteria and mold. And so as those grow and amplify, then they're rebreathed. So that's, that's not a good situation. There's no uh, information on the mask saying when you should replace them. And, of course, you need training uh, on respirators to know how to properly wear them, s- make sure they're sealed, make sure you know when you have to be fit tested, and make sure you know how to store them and replace them. And last but not least, there's the requirement under the respiratory protection standard that someone with proper knowledge and training audit the effectiveness of whether or not the respirators are doing what they should be doing. There's no audit provision on masks to make sure they're actually working or doing something for the individual. The issue of droplets versus aerosols. This is the one area where OSHA, I think, has uh, misguided the public. They talk about Um, interim guidance for PPE, and particularly with respect to droplets versus aerosols. And they make the following statement that's highlighted uh, in the red box. Most workers' exposures to SARS-CoV-2 is likely through the contact of droplets, through contact or droplet routes, although some may be associated with smaller particles, these aerosols I talk about. This is flat-out false. Um, you've been hearing for over and over again, clean surfaces, clean surfaces. Now it's droplets, droplets, droplets. And I'm here to tell you it's always been about the aerosols, the little guys. So again, I'm going to end most of my podcast with this slide because I think it's the core elements of what I want to tell uh, you all about with respect to masks, industrial hygiene, and PPE. Personal protective equipment, as I mentioned in the hierarchy of controls, is the least desirable way to protect people. A more effective way would be through dilution destruction or engineering controls. And recall from the inverted pyramid that masks are not PPE. They're not even in the hierarchy. Um, The other thing that is going to be very important to understand, and we'll have entire podcasts dedicated to this, is that most of the COVID-19 particles are very small aerosols and are not droplets which means respirators, not masks, would be needed to protect the lungs and effectively would make the six-foot rule meaningless. And it turns out, based on the literature, that the smaller particles are of greater concern because they get past the body's defenses. The larger particles either fall to the ground or they're taken up by the mucous tissues from the nose or mouth to the top of the lungs, whereas the little guys, as I call them, the respirable particles or the aerosols, can reach deep into the lung and cause havoc. And again, I will repeat in many, many podcasts, we really should have been sending out the message of dilution, ventilation, dilution, and destruction of the COVID particles as opposed to putting masks on people. Again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel to, feel to write us. Uh, 
Um, We really appreciate the time you spent listening to this, and uh, we'll see you again in the next podcast. Thank you. Have a great day.